All right. Okay. So um, we're moving into the diagnostic section now, which is only one presentation um, um, before the break. And then after that, we're going to have a discussion uh, session on model features and which includes diagnostics and management and everything. And um, Dean's presenting this, um, and he's going to be talking about a cookbook for using diagnostics. So ho hopefully this has solved all our problems. Uh, how do you use the mouse? It's a little worrying if I was using the pointer and then Yeah, maybe I'll use the button. So um, I think I'll just use the computer button. Yeah, thank you. I, I am a uh, co-author on this. Uh, this was an interesting project to work on, and I um, enjoyed it, and I'm looking forward to telling you uh, what we did. So the, uh, so the, uh, the first thing I'll talk about is a little background about uh, the diagnostics that we chose to implement, some of the literature. Then I'll provide a couple study cases from ICAT. Uh, Shortfin Mako and White Marlin, and then uh, some discussion about how this fits into your goals for uh, next generation models. So the uh, the brain trust is these um, previous uh, previous the previous work done uh, primarily by Felipe, who was working as a Capham scholar actually, and uh, looked at uh, simulated data sets and, and tested some of the current diagnostics and, and how they perform. The, the take home from this study is that no one diagnostic worked in all cases and that uh, instead uh, use of a carefully selected range of diagnostics, pretty much the ones we're used to, worked in most cases, you know, so it was informative to actually run more than one diagnostic on your model. So for example, the uh, R0 profiles, age structured production models and retrospective analyses performed well, but then some others like uh, catch curve analysis didn't perform as well. And then some, some interesting ones, the retrospective analysis didn't perform well all the time, but it was still informative to run because it, it gave us an insight into how the models were working. So what we decided for this presentation is not to recommend any diagnostics or recommend an approach to implementing them, but, but more just to discuss that it was useful for us to imp implement a range of diagnostics. And so we'll show you how that panned out. Uh, in contrast, uh, Mark Monder and Kevin Piner uh, developed a algorithm. So sort of a step-by-step -step process about how to develop integrated models and identify misspecification. They looked at a simulated data set where the authors didn't know what the simulated data set had imposed misspecification, but the authors didn't know what it was. And their, their algorithm was useful in identifying and correcting this uh, misspecification in some cases. So this is an interesting, interesting paper. And we want to build on their flow chart. Uh, the, the flow chart is, is difficult to read, but the main, the main things we want to take away were the, the use of the age structure production model is useful and, and as a kind of a first step. And then looking at the residuals, patterns in residuals is, is really important. So those are the things we focus on. We, we also work uh, in the RFMO world with uh, production models still. And so the, the Bayesian production model Java uh, has been used in our assessments and the authors were kind enough to adapt some of their residual plots for our work in integrated analysis. And then we've been working with uh, Lori Kell. As was mentioned earlier, he works in the FLR world and uh, we adapted his hindcast as a diagnostic too. So I'll discuss that. So this is sort of the flow of uh, how we're, we've been looking at diagnostics. The, the left-hand side is sort of the initial step. You, you want to make sure that your model is fitting the data in the normal way. And you look at, if the data is in the model, you want to fit it. You look at the residuals, make sure you don't have um, any issues. And then you, you know, test for model convergence. But then the new thing that we've been doing is, is, is on the right-hand side where we'll 
run a suite of diagnostics to check for correlated parameters, retrospective analysis, hind casting, uh, the profile likelihoods, and then Felipe Carvalho has generated some plot diagnostics that make it easier to look at randomness of recruitment. I mean, randomness of the residuals that's kind of hard to see by eye. So our case studies were from the ICAT recent short fin Mako assessment and a striped marlin assessment. The, the data that we use in these models is data moderate. We don't have any age data, but we have a long history of catches. We have catch pre effort from the fleets. And then in this case, length composition, that's the short fin Mako. The white marlin has similar data, uh, catches, abundance index, uh, we're using areas as fleets so that if they have similar length composition, we assume that they're the, they have a, a similar removals efficient length. And then they also had conditional uh, length today too. So like I said, we, we assume that the, the model has converged and you've checked the diagnostics uh, in the usual way. You know, So the first thing to do is just make sure the Hessian uh, inverts and we look for a for example, I've been looking at if there's excessive CVs or highly correlated or uncorrelated parameters or parameters on bound. And we did all of our modeling and stock synthesis and R4SS will put this stuff out in the plot. So you can basically look at this as you're running your model. And then uh, in addition to that, so we kind of have two convergence diagnostics. The, the jitter is useful to run I'm sure everybody's familiar with this, but in stock synthesis, you can randomly select the starting parameters based on the, the prior and the distribution and run it a bunch of times and make sure that the, 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 none of the runs converge to a lower likelihood than your base model. So this, this plot indicates that a couple of the runs had not converged to the same place, but they were at higher likelihood, so we consider that okay. If you run MCMC, you want to do MCMC diagnostics since you can use the CODA package and try to determine if your MCs have converged. No, never use Heidelberger well. And never use Heidelberger well. No, you never fail. Yeah, you don't fail, but. Don't do it. You never fail. Listen to him. It yeah. Works. <laughs> it's hard to tell if you've converged, but sometimes you can tell if you haven't. Is that? No. No? Never okay. <laughs> if you're desperate, though. I was definitely. So moving on, if you use MCMC, the, the reviewers are going to, at, at the workshops, it's going to be important to present some diagnostics for your MCMC, so use your discretion. So the, the new ones that we're going to talk about here are, um, after you've looked at your residuals, there may be more options. So for example, the, the Java folks have developed a, uh, a plot where you can look at the residuals to your CPUEs. And uh, in, in this case, you look at them all at one time. So these are the, the circles are the residuals on the log scales uh, centered on their means over time. And if you have more than one CPUE that you're fit to in a given year, then you can get some range statistics, which are these quantile boxes. And you can fit a low, a smoother to it, and, and just look at, and you can also look at the spread of the residuals over time. So it, in the different color circles would be the different CPUEs that we fit to in this model, and the solid black line would be a lowest smoother. You can also compute the root mean squared error and interpret it like a standard error, where you'd, you'd want a smaller value there for your fit. Uh, so that that's useful, Felipe has also developed some plots that we've been using to look at the same data in a different way. So this is the, these are the residuals to the fit for each CPUE series in the model, series one through six. And, and what we're doing here is looking at, we're just using a runs test from R to determine if the uh, series are random or, or not. So if the, if the color code is red, that means that there's a non-random pattern. In, in addition, there's, there's another test, which is this three sigma rule. So if any of your points are outside of three standard deviations, that's, that's what these, the gray bar here is. That, that 
is another indication that they may be non-random. So that you can you can quickly look at this and then go back into your data and see if you can figure out what's the cause of that. We're also trying to apply this, since we use length data, we're trying to apply this to the length residuals, but you know there isn't any one point that comes out from the fit. So Felipe pulled out the uh, the standardized residuals. So in this case, it was from uh, the Francis weighting. And I'm not sure if he recomputed these in R, or I think you can just pull them out, in this case, from stock synthesis. But you could use other metrics to summarize the length compositions. In this case, there were five fleets with length composition, and each point represents the mean length in that year. And the color coding scheme is the same. If, if they were red, it would have been a, you passed, I mean, you failed the run test and it's non-random. And then these large boxes are the three standard deviations. So, so most of these were actually within the three standard deviations. That, that's pretty much all that is. You can apply these to the recruitment deviations. Although in this case, you, you'd often expect that there would be non-random patterns in your recruitment, but it, it can help you just quantitatively identify them. So in this case, this is for a short bin Mako, which would not be <laughs> expected to have high recruitment variability. So a, you know, some of the points being significantly lower in the past, significantly higher in, the few, it, in more recent years, it is problematic. Uh, so this is a, a warning sign for this assessment. We also applied the usual uh, age stru structure production model. This is the sort of the first step in uh, the Maunder Heiner flowchart. Uh, in stock synthesis, you can detune the model to be an age structure production model. And you can run that model and compare it to the full model. And if the, uh, and this, this is relative biomass over time, if those deviate, then it's suggesting that your model's not picking up the production function correctly. Um, and so that's a warning sign that you may wanna go back into the model and revisit the uh, stock recruit production in the natural mortality, for example. And I'll discuss that later because some of the other diagnostics in this case were consistent with that. This is the R0 profile likelihood. I, I think most people are familiar with it. You, on the lower axis is the uh, important scaling parameter in the model, the log of equilibrium recruitment. On the y-axis is the change in the log likelihood. So bigger values on the y-axis suggest that the data component is more important. Shifts on the x-axis indicate that the different components want different values for the minimum likelihood. And so if you, if you see a, a nice pattern like this, then there's, there's agreement. But if you see lines like this, there's disagreement. These are the CQEs. These are the fits to length composition, which are in disagreement with CQE. And then these are the total for recruitment, length composition, and survey, which have slightly different minimums. So there's data conflict in here that you'd want to address with uh, data weighting. Another analysis is the, the retrospective analysis where you, you peel back the years and refit the model. So you remove one year, refit the model, remove, refit, remove, refit, remove, refit. And then you, you plot, for example, the spawning output um, overlaid on top of each other. And you can see that over time, the, in the past, the model was overestimating absolute scale. So th this is another warning sign. Um, but then in order to determine the magnitude of those differences, you can look at the asymptotic uncertainty around the ending points, you know? So if, the, if all these lines are within the uncertainty for the ending model, it might not be as much of a concern. There's also a mons rho statistic that uh, is cited in the literature and there's some rules of thumb about what might be uh, uh, reasonable values for that. And that, this is the uh, prediction skill diagnostic that we're using. It's an extension of the uh, retrospective analysis. So as the, the last speaker mentioned, it's in FLR. And Lori Kell uh, has been running this for us. And, and what it does is 
as you peel back the model one year at a time, the uh, FLR package is used to project back one year. So a one step ahead forecast using catchability and biomass and then, and then compare the prediction with the observed. And uh, then you do that for multiple years and you can get an average residual actually it's predicted and observed over time. And in addition to things like root mean squared error, Lori is really keen on this um, mean absolute error, which is, which is comparing the predicted value to what you get from a naive forecast. And in, in this case, the naive forecast is just last year's value. Uh, and the interesting thing about this is that when you do the math, it scales to one. So if the, if the hindcast results, I'll summarize it, I'll show you in the next slide. If the scaled error is less than one, the scaled error is less than one, if the fit arises from a better forecast than the average one step ahead naive forecast. So I'll show you what that looks like. So these are, and this is, a, and this is again, I, I failed to mention this. This is prediction skill. So it's, 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 it's a useful diagnostic that you can compare across models. And the, um, this would be the different CPUEs in each panel here. These would be the, the circles are the observed, the, the lines are the one step ahead forecast. And then I think, and then these MACE scores are reported here. So here's a MACE score of both one. And, uh, and then here's another MACE score above one. So in this case, the MACE scores for CPUE indexes for two of the important indices were greater than one. So this diagnostic result indicated that the average one step ahead naive forecast, that means if you used last year's observations, that would be better than the model at predicting these indexes. Uh, so these case study results. So that the, the suite of diagnostics were pretty consistent. So the diagnostic and prediction skill results were consistent. There were significant non-random recruitment thieves in combination with the failed age structure production model, poor out of sample prediction skill. And if you look back at the flow chart uh, from Mark and Kevin, this monitor in Piner 2017, they have an interesting discussion in there about how this, this may indicate a, a failure in, in the uh, system model or the estimating the production function. And that the next steps would be to go back and evaluate sensitivity there. Uh, in our case, this is this is uh, this this is pretty. This has been a useful exercise. So, where does this fit in with uh, the goals of this group? So, the focus questions addressed basically coding. Uh, is there a way to easily allow addition of new features? I think that's the most important one. Uh, these diagnostics change over time, and the diagnostics will change depending on what model you're using. But at least in the RFMO world, we work on consensus and, and often what happens is we'll spend a week developing a model. People will have suggestions. Uh, we'll have a suite of sensitivities that people want to run. We'll want to examine different options. And by the end of the week, we won't have time really to look at the diagnostics, uh, which was the case for this swordfish assessment. And it would be nice to just push a button and, and have them running. And so that's what we're trying to do, actually. So we've been, Felipe and I, along with our co-authors, have been working to try to bring these all into R and have them available for us so that when we get in that situation, we can just push the button and run these diagnostics. Uh, so in this case, these models were run in stock synthesis. We used R for SS to pull the data out of stock synthesis. Then we used R or FLR to run the diagnostics. We had version issues, it mattered. Um, I ran my stock assessment in three to, stock synthesis 324. Mike Sharifa ran the white marlin assessment in 330, so we had to change diagnostics. And Felipe has been working in the background along with the other co-authors to update the R code for stock synthesis 330. And we're, we're going to try to develop a, a GitHub version of these. 
And then we also want to say that we're big fans of R4SS. And we discovered through this process that R4SS has functions for many of these diagnostics built in. So the uh, retrospective analysis, the R0 likelihood component profile and the jittering, and they're much easier to use than the way that we did it. Uh, so we went back and um, changed our code and compared it to these and you know we get the same outputs. And then what, what we're doing now is just writing some simple pseudocode to wrap our data sets to be able to call these functions with our data sets because that's actually kind of a complicated aspect of it. So hopefully those will be available in the future. They're, they're not available yet, but you can speak with Felipe or the other co-authors about that. And that's all I have. Thanks, Dean. So does anyone have any questions? Jump. Just thanks, Dean. Nice talk. I was wondering of all those diagnostics, and maybe it's common knowledge among people that come to Kaplan all the time, but are there some diagnostics that you pay more attention to than others? I mean. So that it, there, that's probably a good question for the group, but I'll answer my, my, my experience is pretty limited. So like I said, we were in a situation where I spent the majority of the time fitting to the data. And at the end of the meeting, I hadn't run any diagnostics. So the chair of the working group politely came up to me off stage and said, you know, Dean, we usually run diagnostics. And then I spent the next year uh, working with the co-authors to learn which diagnostics are commonly used and applied them. So I don't, I don't have a feeling about which one is the best. Well, what one do you hate most? Yeah. <laughs> Heidelberger Welsh. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, there's, uh, the, it'd be interesting to follow up on Felipe's previous paper. So what we did was we generated data with some known biases and tried to detect them. There's obviously more things here than, than we tested. So I think that's an interesting extension to this work. Um, I still have some issues with the production model um, uh, diagnostic myself because it would say that no small pelagic has ever been assessed correctly, which I'm not sure I would agree with, because um, you'll never find a production function in a small pelagic, based on my experience. Um, so I think there's that. I was intrigued by the diagnostic that comes out of the Winker paper with the um, multiple time series of residuals, um, and just trying to work out what the null hypothesis for that would be. It's not complete. I, I like the plot, but I'm trying to work out what a good one is, uh, because in some sense, they should be independent between series, which they weren't, so that's interesting. Um, they should have mean zero standard deviation one. So if you get a smaller value than one for those residuals, you've got a problem. It's a different problem, but it's still a problem. Um, and this is Bayesian, so I'm assuming it's an integral over not just the best fit, but an integral over the whole posterior, and I'm intrigued to know what that means. So maybe. Maya, who is an author of the original paper, can comment. Uh, okay, well, maybe I should just cede the floor then now, if that's the case. Um, yeah, uh, yeah, if you want to bring up the plot. I Sorry, think, Maya. oh, forward a couple more. Yeah, um, when we originally developed this, I think we were just looking for general illustration. I don't think there was um, really strong consideration given to some of the things you mentioned. Um, I don't know, Dean, if you want to add anything to that, but I think, yeah. Go ahead. Just to follow up, I mean, I really find this quite intriguing. I mean, I, I don't like assessments with 43 time series. I know it's a tuna thing. Uh, but it tells me that, for example, there's a, you know, if I look at that, if you, if you see a distribution that doesn't overlap the zero line, that's, a, that's an indication of, of um, in lack of independence between the residuals, in which case there's less information in this data set than the, whoever did the analysis was hoping there would be. Because, you, you know, you shouldn't be using all seven series because they're not independent, at least in some years. It's not too bad, but they're quite a few years I can see that don't intersect the line. Um, and you've got, you don't have that many data points. So 
if Hans was here, he would tell me what how, exactly how many you expect a priori, but I can't remember. So that, this is cool. Hmm? I completely don't get how you interpret this being. So the correct, if this is, if these were just random numbers, which you hope our residuals are, you would expect, uh, if these are residuals, which they can't be because they wouldn't, that wouldn't have worked, they should have, they should all have mean zero, standard deviation one, right, because they're standardized residuals. They should be a flat line, that's I like the lowest. Uh, they shouldn't intersect, they, they should all be sitting on the zero line. There shouldn't be any of those ones that are consistently above, because that says there's essentially a catchability residual that's the same across all the series, which violates the independence assumption. So I, I like the plot, and I just like to see it taken, <coughs> taken further. But you don't have to worry, because you know one survey, so you wouldn't be able to do this. Uh, sorry, I won't belabor it, but I mean, it seems to me the frequency of residuals being above or below the line across indices, it seems like you want to look at them split out in trends in the residuals rather than like this, because you're just hiding like what, what or maybe other people see it. I just don't see what, how you would pull out of this that there's something wrong with one data series here that needs no, no, further. It's the whole thing. I know it's the whole thing. That's my problem. There's something wrong with the whole thing, not just one. <laughs> no, no, actually, that's, a, that's, a, that's an interesting observation. So that I, I also didn't, I'm not completely clear on the interpretation of this. So it would be nice if Henning was here, and I know he's watching, so I apologize in advance, because he, he would be able to provide an interpretation. Mine is more of just looking at it to see the patterns. Um, but as far as, as far as the interpretation of the, the different CPUE series, they were sort of, they had a similar pattern that was difficult to explain. Um, it may have been a market issue. And so that was something that we were trying to get at in the assessment too. Okay, John. Thanks. Um, it's kind of an intriguing finding the one step ahead um, diagnostic where, you know, doing the short term projection resulted in a better estimate of next year's metric, whatever it was, biomass, than doing the with the full with the full t um, new data, it kind of would, would the managers not come out and say, "Well, what's the value of the new data? Is it zero or less than zero?" And rub their hands together and say, "We can stop <laughs> monitoring." Of course, you know you do this enough years, I'm, I'm sure that breaks down. But w were you able to diagnose that finding uh, a, a little bit more and and come to a conclusion as to why it might have occurred? Well, so the. the this, this isn't an axis of uncertainty that we looked at in the model. So when we, when we formulated this model, we use a demographic analysis based on the life history to develop a production value, a steepness value for the model. And so what this lack of prediction skill indicates is that we may have the wrong combination of production and natural mortality. And, and so that we would go, we would then go back into the assessment and look at a sensitivity of that to see if we can improve the prediction skill, reduce the recruitment deviation, um, you know, the, re reduce that pattern in rec ease, which probably isn't realistic for a Mako shark. So that's, that's how we interpreted it. Yeah. Jim Marie. Um, I noticed you liked your profile on log Z R0. Um, just wondering whether you considered doing that on B0 instead, which might be a bit e easier to interpret. Uh, this one? Yeah. Yeah, maybe. I, I think you'd get similar results. I mean, so the R0 is the scaling parameter that's estimated. It's the actual estimated function. B0 is derived from that. That's why you remove the confounding due to N and growth. Oh, interesting. I don't know. Mamoka? Yeah, Mamoka. So, uh, we sometimes uh, find uh, autocorrelation of uh, time series residual patterns of uh, abundance index. So uh, I think it is also uh, important uh, 
diagnostic to see how much autocorrelation is occurred in each CPU series. Yes, yeah, so I think Mamoko is saying that they, they often find autocorrelation in the CPUE series. And it, a good test might be to determine if there is autocorrelation in the series. And, and we've, we've had that comment before. I think uh, maybe Rick or others um, in our email chain have suggested that, and we haven't uh, gotten to it yet. But yeah, so there are other time series. There's a lot of time series analyses approaches that could be used on these on these um, recruitment, these aren't recruitment, but on the residual patterns. Um, one drawback of the time series analysis is they usually require a long time series. So that we chose this random test because it was a, uh, uh, I think I have it written here, wait. It's, yeah, I think that, so we chose this particular test because uh, it's non-parametric, I think. Just, Maybe it's not suffer so much from the low sample size. Okay, any other questions? Yeah, Rick. On the uh, one step ahead predictions, I would have thought that was already built into SS and wouldn't have needed to s jump out in order to get that one step ahead. Since it's already gonna be within the retrospective period it's already gonna be giving you an expected value for any observation that is now being ignored. So the author of the model suggests it's already in there. That's great, we'll have to talk offline. And I'll just, so as you're suggesting we just pull that out. Yeah. It's yeah. already providing a prediction. Yeah, and so that, that's an interesting comment. And obviously we, uh, we, we did this, um, it's kind of a multi-platform exercise, you know, so we, we use stock synthesis, but then we pulled the data out and, and generated it independently. But I, I think a general question or hope would be that this could be something that would be available in the model in the future. And it, in addition to cross-validation, where, so for, for time series with low sample size, it's one, instead of doing these forecasts, you can right, remove one year and predict and compare. And so that would be an interesting, I think, useful aspect to have built into the model. Okay, thanks, Dave. All right, thank you. Okay, so we're gonna break.